You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to a very special best of edition of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I am Tom Knezic, and it is the holiday season, and uh, which in the nursery industry can be a very slow time as far as, as plants go, but it also yes. is a very busy time because uh, we got a lot to do before that January 1 date, and you got Christmas thrown in there and other stuff thrown in there. And, and then we come into the new year, and I think we have five conferences or trade shows oh, yeah. in a three-week span yeah so and Fran's one of which off wassailing <laughs> friend do you do you actually know what wassailing is do you have you like heard that whole the what well basically the history of what it is i don't like i know that it's a drink and yeah. i know that saul had mentioned it years ago yeah and you may have mentioned it to me but i don't recall what I don't, it is i don't know if it's a drink too but basically what it was is You'd have um, men in, like, old towns, and they would go from door to door, kind of like trick-or-treating in a sense, yeah. and they would just get drunk, and they would have a big bowl of their drink, and they would be like, we'll trade you some of our drink for <laughs> something in your house. <laughs> and, that that and, um, sounds like pretty much... Yeah. I guess it would get a little out of hand at times. Yeah, that, and, that basically can reflect my years yeah. of 18 to 22 yeah, a lot of singing <laughs> going on so I, I guess one of their favorites was figgy pudding which is why they uh, screamed we give us your figgy pudding and all that so. i love it i yeah. love that saul is bringing that back yep. so yep. so today we're giving we're only doing one best of this holiday season we'll be back next week mm-hmm. and we're going to do our top 10 episodes of all time not of the year but the way we update this every year at the same time, but it always tends to be all new episodes that have typically come out within the last year. Yeah. So it's kind of both, but we'll be back with that next week. But this week we're doing a best of two episodes that we're kind of revisiting back. There were it's episode 13 and 14, I believe. Exactly. They were back to back, and it was uh, a very complicated topic. And. Where a lot of people just can't agree on what to do, and uh, and that is the and so well, actually we just in the Facebook group someone was asking what um what everyone's favorite episodes were, and a few people actually named this back to back as one of their favorite segments, and that is uh, the issue of deer when it comes to native plants. So this was pretty early on for us. It was episode thirteen, fourteen. So it was Jay Kelly, Doctor Jay, yeah, Jay Kelly, Jay Kelly from Raritan Rar- Valley Community College. He said something – I don't want to spoil it because everyone's about to listen to it if you haven't heard it. He said something very enlightening at the very end because you could tell he was taking this crisis very – not personally, but it was very – an emotional crisis. Yeah. Um, So it was very telling and very informative. Uh, Yeah. And then on the contrast, the other side. The other side was uh, was Kip Adams from – at that time was uh, QDMA. Uh, which is Quality Deer, Quality Deer Management Association. Now it is actually the National Deer Alliance. Um, there's two organizations kind of merged there. Right as we were doing this recording, I think they just announced that they were going to change uh, a day or two before we we did the recording. And um, so kind of what I really loved about it was you have two different viewpoints in a sense. Yeah. You have one uh, one individual saying, hey, we have too many deer. What do we do so that they aren't impacting our natural ecosystems? And the other one saying, we're trying to hunt deer and attract deer and have better quality deer in, in that sense, um, healthier deer herds. And, um, yeah, what's interesting is they have a lot of similarities in approach, yes. and which was I – th- I think we kind of knew that going in, which is why we wanted to have them on back-to-back yeah. back so we could – so prove, prove that's a little point. bit of a spoiler, but but it's it's one that the people that listened uh, really enjoyed and got a lot out of. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting for us is for the for the listeners that we have now, we're very humbled with the amount of listens that a new podcast gets. But when you go back a hundred and seventy episodes, those early episodes really didn't get a lot of exposure, and a lot of people didn't make their way back. So. 
these best ofs gives us the opportunity like when we redid uh, Dwayne Estes and Dr. Doug Tallamy, those episodes got three – Three times more listens than they originally did, mm-hmm. so yep. it's giving some, some some exposure for some early episodes that are still a little raw, but had really good framework and topic that got us to where we're at today. Yeah. So we're excited to be able to share this with you over the holiday season. Uh, Tom, do you have any holiday uh, plans? Any any special plans? Oh man, I'm sure we do, but uh, I'm so full of flautas that I don't remember. I am too. I, I think we're yeah we're. The day after Christmas, we're going to my aunt's house. And then now that my son's three and a half, it's we said, hey, we're not running around all over the place. Um, I'm not doing what uh, was somewhat done to me as a kid. I'm not, you had to go up I'm to New York every year. I'm not dragging yeah. my three-year-old away from all his toys that he just received that he's going to be really excited about just to, to go everywhere else. So. Yeah. You love us, you can come see us. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what we threw I, out there. I get it. I've been there. But you don't know, show up until the afternoon. That was the, yeah, the rules. They, the flip side for me, my my children, which are older in their 20s, my youngest can't visit this year um, because of work. Um, mm-hmm. He's in retail and, yeah. and can't take off at this time of the year. Last year was – he's a manager now. And last year they told him, they're like, you had the schedule, so we're going to let it go, but you're not doing it in the future. Yeah. So we'll see him in March for his birthday. Um, and then my oldest is only going to be home for one week. We got him for a week, and then he's off to a cruise and then back to college. Yeah. So so it's cool. – it's the the holidays kind of change over the, the year. For sure. But, but it will be a for little sure. more laid yeah. back. So, But we got two great episodes coming up for you back-to-back here. Next week, Tom and I will be back with episode 190, which will be uh, – our best top 10 episodes of all time. Uh, and and it's we, a brand new list compared brand, to last year, which no is one, awesome. They, number one last year was um, Native Plants and Small Spaces with Joan Brandwine. It hung on till the very end. She yep. just got bumped off the list. So and, and every year when we do the top 10, we look at number one and we're like, nothing's ever going to beat this. And here it is. It didn't make the top 10. I mean, she's number 11. But uh, – it's a whole new list this year, so it should be pretty interesting. So make sure you tune in for that, and until then, keep it native. You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Welcome to part one of our two-part series. Thank you for tuning back in to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic. We're doing something a little bit different this time. Um, I guess we're still just having one guest on for an interview, but there's actually going to be a follow-up to this with a, uh, I don't even want to say an alternative perspective, but a uh, a different perspective. A different perspe- yeah, it's so, not really alternative, but, but it's different. Yeah, but... A lot of our listeners have requested – probably the number one thing that's been requested is uh, is more information on deer management, um, primarily how to how to keep deer away from their gardens or, or just even in woodlands and all that kind of stuff, just trying to manage deer because where we are in New Jersey, um, specifically suburban New Jersey, uh, they can be a bit of a nuisance. So It's – yeah, you know, not even – You know, growing up in in Pennsylvania, I remember areas in northeast Philly where there'd be a small clearing turning around and counting Mm. 200 deer, you know, and then having them disperse and not even realizing where they went because there was (laughs) there there was no area for them to go. So Mm -hmm. um, we know it's a it's it's a concern for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but there is an again, I don't want to say it's an alternative, but there is another not even viewpoint, but another approach where you actually have people usually in rural parts of the countries where they own a lot of land and uh, if, if especially hunters where they actually want to bring in deer. And um, I've heard a lot of podcast guests on some of these hunting focus podcasts where uh, traditionally, if you guys remember the, the National Wild Turkey Federation episode, they're talking about food plots. Well, a lot of these deer management um, technicians are using a lot of natives with these food plots and uh, in fact, they're saying that's probably even more important than the food. The, the non-native stuff they're planting, the, the soybeans and clovers, that's the ice cream. But a lot of this native stuff, that's their salads and, and the staples of what they need for their diet. And, and it's, yeah. a, it's a double-edged sword because yeah. on one hand, you know, if you're trying to lure them in and feed them, native plants are their native 
native food. That's mm-hmm. their native palate. But if, if you're trying to plant natives and, and keep them <laughs> keep them safe and healthy, you're also attracting deer in. Yep. So um, it will be really interesting. We've had a lot of requests for this, oh, so, yeah. I'm, so I'm yeah. really excited. So um, just to go back with something that we touched on on the last podcast. So I was, I was checking in on our VPN experiment to see if we had any listens on Croatia. And all week I kept going, no listens, no listens. You know, we, we had picked up another state and, and actually like four more countries mm-hmm. and uh, nothing. So I, I realized today that there was a listen in Croatia. Yeah, and that was me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was that was, was my first experience. I was checking too, and look, I've friends more into looking at the countries and states that I am, and I looked, and I'm like, oh, no one actually listened from there. So I went and made sure that there was at least one. So there was one, but, but and really just to make sure it worked. I didn't. I'm new to the whole VPN private network thing, so I didn't know how it worked. Or I, on one hand, it I'm, worked. I'm happy. I'm disappointed that it was you, <laughs> <laughs> but on one hand, that it does work. So that mm-hmm. could really be why we have listens in all these different countries yeah. that that I don't see it being relative relative yeah. really or you know and it it's still such a small part of our, our listener it, base it but. is I think what was it 95% of our listens yeah. are in the United States we kind of so. geek out over this stuff a little we bit. do I really enjoy this, <laughs> this is, <laughs> that's what occupies my free time so I for the longest time I just thought our listeners were lazy and not trying it or they weren't using VPNs yeah. but at least we know what it is but do you want to pick a new country for this week now that now that we know it's possible is there another country you want to take over i'll probably just stick with croatia yeah, okay let's yeah, let's build it up in croatia yeah. we want to be the number yeah. one podcast <laughs> total in croatia so. well but anyway i guess it's time to get started so here's part one of uh of our two-part series hopefully that next part's next week but we got to Check in with our guest to make, make sure it's still possible we're, next we're week. We're hoping we, uh, in, in case we, I don't think we mentioned it, now is the time of the year we're going to try to go back to one episode a week. Mm-hmm. So we're ramping up. If things are slowing down at the nursery, we're going to try to ramp back up. We really enjoyed doing one a week, and we think the listeners mm-hmm. do too. So we're going to try to get back on that schedule. So this is the start of it where we're trying through all of July and all of August to bring you one a week. So hopefully <laughs> next week is part two. But yeah. If if we can't put it to, pull it together in time, it will be in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it will it will be soon. It won't be far behind. So, and I guess without any uh, any further ado, we'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Kelly from Raritan Valley Community College, who's done a tremendous amount of research on uh, on deer management, especially in the understory of forests right here in New Jersey. And uh, and even though it's right here in New Jersey, it, it probably applies to most of the Mid Atlantic, where you're finding that suburban. Um, Suburban areas where you're created, where we've created a lot of edge habitat, and uh, and without that, uh, Jay, why don't you introduce introduce yourself introduce and, and give us a little bit of your background? Sure, uh, I'm a professor of biology and environmental science at Raritan Valley Community College, like you said. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Raritan Valley is located in central New Jersey in Somerset County. Uh, I've been teaching there for about 12, 13 years, but I'm a New Jersey native, born and bred in central Jersey, and have been working in the forests and other wildlands of the state for the past 25 years, um, partly for the state government and more recently just doing my own research with students. Um, And this issue that you guys are bringing up today about overabundant deer and its effects on the environment, I think are really one of the most pressing concerns for conservation of wild species in New Jersey and really throughout the Northeast uh, of this this continent. Um, So thank you very much for bringing it to everybody's attention. No problem. You know, it's, and and we've, we've known it's an issue, but it really hit home. I, I was listening to a talk being done by Dr. Emil DeVito of um, New Jersey Conservation Foundation. He was just talking about walking through areas that he's been walking through forever and how the understory of forests have changed and where there used to be maple leaf viburnum. There's no more maple leaf viburnum and just the changes that he has seen over time. And he started, you know, from a firsthand experience in a broader sense, it really hit home. So just – and and being born and bred in New Jersey, for you, how how has the deer density changed per acre in New Jersey over say like the last twenty years? Um, well, I think with with the deer population, it's kind of important to take a, a bigger picture view of things. That okay. you know the the levels of deer that we're seeing today uh, may be excessive, but in many ways that's the the, um, the, the result of a, a conservation success story. About a hundred mm-hmm. years ago, New Jersey uh, had pretty much no deer left. 
<laughs> due to uh, the legacy of commercial hunting that had taken place up through the end of the 1800s. And then uh, that was banned, and eventually, with, through the work of generations of biologists that reintroduced deer into New Jersey and implemented more, uh, I think, effective uh, game regulations, we saw the recovery of the deer populations throughout the state. So by the early 1970s, deer had recovered to what are thought to be the background numbers of deer in the wild, which is about 10 deer per square mile. Okay. But because of how things had changed in New Jersey and throughout the region, the numbers continued to climb far above that. So um, by the mid-1980s, the deer had reached about 20 per square mile. The last statewide assessment that was done by the state government took place in 1999 with the governor's report on deer. And that one uh, identified about 38 per square mile on average across the state. But deer numbers are really variable from places like central New Jersey to the Pine Barrens and the mountains up north. And in central portions of the state where we are here, uh, there were as many as about 76 per square mile. Wow. And then the survey that we've been doing for townships and park systems in the past five years have regularly found deer populations in excess of 100 per square mile. And mm. in some places, it's over 300 per square mile. Wow. So That's if, you know, the, yeah. the background numbers of deer, you know, that the, the ecosystems are uh, kind of adapted to handle where everything is more or less in balance are about 10 per square mile. And we know that's the case because when deer numbers get higher than that, you start to see the preferred forage species disappear. You know, the, the tastiest lilies and orchids will disappear from the forest when they're above 10 per square mile. So if you, if, you know, if everything's adapted for 10 per square mile and you have over 300 per square mile, you can imagine what that's going to mean for the, the other species trying to live in the forest. Well, a, a lot has had to have happened for that change to occur. So, which is it's it's running like a ton of questions through my head but how given the lack of habitat which i know is an an issue but how is how is there enough food to sustain them to continue to to grow this population because you figure they have less habitat but there's is it more per square mile just because they're packed in tighter or is like uh, it's amazing well that's that actually a, a misconception so okay. deer are are fairly um resilient and, and adaptable species, and, and there isn't actually a lack of habitat. If anything, there's an increase in habitat relative to what there was historically. Okay. So deer are, are what we think of as an edge species. Yes. They tend to occur on the edges of forest ecosystems in particular, um, and that's for a couple reasons. There's, there tends to be more sunlight hitting you know, those areas, so the vegetation is denser and the things the deer like to eat are present there. But it also provides them with the cover that they need from predators that they can escape to and hide out in the forest. And so typically deer will stay in the forest and hide out during the daytime. And then at night they come out and feed on the edges of forests or in, in open areas around them, in farm fields and gardens and people's, you know, landscaping and so forth. And so, um, you know, with forest fragmentation that uh, took place during the agricultural era in New Jersey up till like the 1920s or 30s, and then later on, through suburban development, we actually have mm-hmm. far more edge habitats than, than there previously were in the past. And then on top of that, they, we've gotten rid of all the predators, the natural predators at least, of wolves and cougars in particular, that kept the deer populations under check. So, um, you know, the, if you left the, if you didn't provide them with supplemental food resources outside of the forest from our gardens and our farm fields, the deer would probably reach about 20 to 40 per square mile uh, in their in their densities, but without predators and with all the extra food that we're putting out there for them, uh, you know, the the carrying capacity of deer at this point is about 100 per square mile, mm-hmm. and th- that's a problem because again, they're spending a lot of their time in the forests, and the forest species can't handle 100 deer per square mile. You're going to have a, a loss of tremendous numbers of plant species and and the kinds of impacts to forest structure and composition that we're seeing today, which is really, you know, balanced at about 10 to 20 deer per square mile. And, and that was one of the questions that Tom and I were actually discussing. If if you're seeing that kind of forest destruction, I don't want to say destruction, but uh, where they're, 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 they're taking more shrub layer away, that's got to be affecting other animals, say, that that use habitat. I know mm-hmm. when we had the the National Wild Turkey Federation on, they're actually starting to see a decline in in turkey. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it it and it's not necessarily predator. They don't believe it's it's predator based. Yeah, it's, it was really a lack, lack of, of of habitat, and some of that is due to to, 
deer to, browsing. To deer browsing. So it's it's is that playing a major effect on other species? That yeah, absolutely. I mean, so um, ecologists refer to that as cascade effects, where mm-hmm. the deer are directly affecting the vegetation, but then all sorts of other species depend on that vegetation for food. And so when the vegetation declines, you start to see declines in the insects that are feeding on the vegetation, in the birds that are feeding on the insects. Um, you also see a loss of bird populations based on what kinds of habitat they need to nest in. So many of our forest birds, for example, put their nests directly on the ground or in the shrubs just above it. And if there's no shrubs and there's no cover to hide the nests, then those bird populations decline. And so we've been seeing really tremendous declines in all of our shrub and ground nesting birds, in a tremendous diversity of our insects, and especially caterpillars, um, and in all the birds that feed on those species as well. So it's not surprising to hear that they've been seeing declines for mm-hmm. turkeys because we've been seeing it with songbirds and many other species for decades now. What What is giving deer the competitive advantage over like the same food source for other species or, or coverage? Like they're obviously – they're growing in numbers. They're able to consume this and, and take away from other species. They, they have some sort of competitive advantage somewhere. Do you, would you have an idea of what that may be or what you've seen? Well, the deer don't really have that much competition for this particular thing that they feed on. I mean, okay. 500 mm-hmm. years ago, we had bison in our forests and we had elk. Um, those no longer exist today. Um, so the deer don't have direct competitors, but what they do affect in terms of competition is the ability of native plants to compete with non-native plants. Mm-hmm. So deer have a really strong preference for feeding on native plant species, and they they will eat in, introduced in exotic plant species, but to a far less degree, and typically when there's only nothing else to eat. And so by suppressing all the native plant species, that gives the invasive plant species uh, a distinct competitive advantage in taking over our forests and other wildlands. And we've seen that play out over and over again. Is, is there any other effects that, that they're having on forest overall health? Um, I, I, I guess that's... Sure, we have... Absolutely. We've seen, you know, from our studies, we've been, for the past six years, looking at how our forests have changed since the mid-20th century. We followed up on about 65 forests that were studied by Rutgers researchers throughout central and northern New Jersey um, up to 1972 or so when deer population had gotten back to what we thought it should be. And we compared it to those same forests to how they look today. And what we found was a 75 to 80 percent decline in tree regeneration, so the trees Mm -hmm. aren't able to reproduce either. And so if that trend continues and we continue to have the absence of young trees in the understory, then we conceivably could lose our forests in the future. And we've actually been seeing that play out in some places uh, in a lot of our younger forests that are dominated by ashes, for example. The emerald ash borer Mm -hmm. has killed off all the ash trees. And um, now, normally that you know wouldn't be necessarily the end of the world because you'd have younger trees beneath them that would be able to grow up and fill their their place. As same thing happened as you know the Dutch elm disease and chestnut blight killed those species mm-hmm. in the past in New Jersey. The forests haven't disappeared because other things were were waiting in the wings to replace them. Yeah. But in these forests, there is zero understory. There's no young trees. There's no native shrubs. It's mostly invasive exotic species. And so when the canopy of ash trees has been decimated. We're actually seeing these places turn into thickets of invasive shrubs and vines. Um, And if these trends continue, you know, on the order of a couple more decades, we're going to start to see significant losses of our forests and a a real conversion of them into shrub and thicket-like ecosystems because there's no young trees um, there to replace the the larger trees as they die, either from disturbances like invasive introduced pests and diseases through, you know, increased uh, severity of storms from climate change, or just from natural, you know, mortality. Eventually, trees get old and die like anything else, and they're, the forests are going to depend on young trees to fill their mm-hmm. ranks. And right now, there are no young trees in the majority of our forests, and, and certainly not enough to replace them as they die. And that's something I've noticed, just, and I'm sure a lot of people have noticed, when you walk through the forest, uh, a good indicator to me that there's a lot of deer there is if you can see, well, definitely more than 100 yards. If you can see probably even more than 50 yards, that means that you've lost a lot of that shrub layer and you've lost a lot of the the regeneration that's going to happen just because deer are over-browsing it. In fact, just on, a, on one of our farms, walking through the forest, uh, like edge at the back of the farm, um, the, you can see a long, long way, and there's really not much growing in there. And I did find a Japanese barberry growing in there. Yeah. But well, you, you know, it's funny you said that because 
uh, the last episode we had Carolyn Clava from Sour Lang Conservancy, mm-hmm. and they were saying that their density is is over a hundred a uh, hundred deer per mile. Yeah, yeah and um, I was just hiking there. Like after after we had her on, we were hiking there, and in the first clearing we came to, came right up to a buck, <laughs> and where the where there was a down tree, there was barberry growing. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, you see the effects immediately. Like, and that's. Um, you know, and those are things that they're not eating, like uh, Crystal Lake and, and Burlington County Parks. Mm-hmm. There's big, big understories of burning bush where they don't belong, and that's that's surviving well. But none of the other understory yeah. is there. You know, in, in our forest today, in, in terms of the shrub and, and the woody vines, there's actually more invasive cover than there is native cover at this point. If you compare it back mm-hmm. to the mid 20th century and those studies that were done that I talked about, um, the herb layer is holding its own a little better, but we're really seeing a, a dramatic conversion of our of our forest ecosystems into, um, you know, completely foreign assemblages of plant species that have no place here. And and the important thing, as far as that goes, aside from competing with native plants, is those species don't offer the same value for wildlife and for other ecosystem services because a lot of the insects that you know live in the forest will will not choose to eat those plant species. They're they're really adapted to the to, to uh, find their food based on specific chemical cues. You know you that a native plant might be releasing, you get rid of that native plant, and that insect can no longer live in the forest. And so we have a loss of uh, forage value for insects and other wildlife. We have a loss of nesting habitat for birds. Other impacts that you had had asked about are, you can see, without all that vegetation that should be there in the forest, we're seeing increases in uh, erosion. You know, soil is washing away. you got increases in nutrient loss from these ecosystems. You've got soil compaction from massive herds of deer moving through these places in some cases. So we're really seeing a, a, a radical transformation, both biologically and in the physical landscape of these places, due to the continual overabundance of deer, um, you know, decade after decade at this point. You know, and, and, and not only that, if you think about it, if there's a, a lack of, of native understory and you're getting exotics coming in, that's allowing for exotic um, – Invasive pests, yeah. insects and pests too. Like we're seeing that with um, the spotted lanternfly right now, yeah. and with tree of heaven, and and you see a tree of heaven everywhere. I mean, they've they've naturalized here very quickly. Uh, so it's you know it's a it's a double edged sword that way too because mm-hmm. it's bringing in all the exotics which have an advantage over our native. Yeah. So um, is are we are we at this point? the apex predator for for deer is it is it human have they, at least in new jersey is there is there yeah and in fact it's probably our cars i was gonna say it's probably it's probably cars are the- <laughs> now, even in places that are hunted the the towns and and park systems that i've been working with that keep track of how many deer the hunters are taking compared to local vehicle collisions in most cases the vehicles are taking more than the hunters are at this point wow but in either case it, it definitely it is humans that that are the, the primary predators at this point and unfortunately, we just aren't as efficient as wolves at uh, driving down deer populations in the way that the forests need us to. And I, I, you know, I know this is silly, but I guess we'll never see a reintroduction of wolves because of so many other factors. It's mm-hmm. too we're too populated of a state. I would guess. I, I think there would be a lot of people opposed of. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you're right. Um, you know, the the most successful example on the continent that that I'm aware of of wolf reintroduction happened in Yellowstone mm-hmm. National Park in the 1990s, and they've seen really just an incredible transformation of the ecosystem in those places as a result over the the next 10 or 20 years. The elk and deer populations um, changed their movement patterns. The populations declined, and they saw a resurgence of native plant. Um, species and the insects that fed on those plants and then the wildlife that fed on them. Um, the, there was a reduction in um, soil erosion and a restoration of the streams through those ecosystems. I mean, it was just a wholesale correction of the kinds of negative decline and trends that we've been seeing in New Jersey just as a result of, re- you know, mm-hmm. reinstating that, that keystone predator that had been missing because of its you know, extirpation by people. Yeah. So I think you're right that it's not going to happen in New Jersey anytime soon. Um, they, I, I've heard that they attempted a reintroduction of wolves in, in Yellowstone. Um, sorry, in Great Smoky Mountain National Park okay. uh, after they were so successful in Yellowstone, and it failed because of conflicts with local domestic animals and people. Um, they also had the, the wolves were breeding with wild domestic dogs, and oh. I think 
one of the more important factors was they also picked up distemper and other diseases from domestic dog populations. Mm -hmm. So um, if it, if it's not going to work in Smoky Mountains, I don't think it's going to work very easily. No, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I know a, a big concern is them roaming because predators will roam. Uh, but I, there's probably enough food here where they don't need to roam. <laughs> yeah. There's enough yeah. access <laughs> where they could they yeah. could just pick them off and not have to go anywhere. Like, and that's what I'm wondering. It when you get to those numbers, I don't I don't know that the wolves would need to necessarily look elsewhere uh, for food. But eventually, I guess over time, it would be you would hope mm -hmm. that would balance out. But I don't know. Is is there? Well, well, deer population is there? Can they level off on their own? Is or well, right Obviously. now they've leveled off, at, you know, as I mentioned, about 100 per square mile is what they've leveled off at in, in suburban areas in central New Jersey. Um, other factors can cause them to go down. Um, you know, there's parts of the Midwest, they have um, diseases that are affecting some of mm -hmm. the deer, and in smaller portions of New Jersey, deer have been uh, affected by disease as well. But uh, nothing that's really causing them to go back down to the levels that we need them to for to restore our forests. Well, I would imagine a lot of that is because of how successful our agricultural system has been. And um, I, I talk about our farm again, and it's really the farmer next door. Um, when I've walked along their fields, you see all of the deer damage that have been done to, oh, well, uh, there was a corn crop last year that when it should have been eight feet tall, there was parts that were two or three feet tall just because you had deer coming out every night just eating back those plants and um, and he was upset about it but you have something that's really high nutrient that's um easily yeah. accessible to them and well, you think about why our human population's gotten so big as well it's because how successful our agricultural systems systems have been especially in the united states and uh and yeah it's not just agriculture but landscaping you know yeah. we have our yeah. all of our gardens and landscaping that get you know watered uh, they're fertilized, and so you've got all this lush vegetation that's just there for the deer to feast on. And then on top of that, in, especially in suburban settings, they're also refuges from hunters. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to hunt in dense suburban areas, but the deer can live perfectly happily in those places. Um, and so, you know, it's just kind of the, the perfect storm of, of all the things that kept deer populations in check have kind of fallen by the wayside, and all the things that deer need to increase their populations are being fully provided for them. And so that's really what it boils down to and why we're seeing the, the tremendous increases across the, the region uh, in deer populations. One of the things I was curious, you know, typically deer would graze, say, open meadow, and then they go back into the uh, the forest for shelter. And that's, you know, typically they'll go in the forest. Their excrement will actually fertilize the, the ground in the forest. If there's an overpopulation and an over an abundance of deer excrement, is that changing – is, does that have an effect on the overall forest health, where it's getting? That's too a good much question. Nutrients? I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I haven't okay. seen any research on that question, but I think it's definitely something that um, makes sense and is worthy of consideration. That's that. Sorry, that one just popped into yeah. my head. I, <laughs> I just had a question pop into my, my head too, where it's uh, a, someone else I'd heard speaking about um, deer overpopulation, and they had tied it to earthworms, and. I don't remember the exact connection. I think it was the more compact soils were better for earthworms. I don't remember. Um, earthworms also primarily being non-native. Have you done any research on the connections between deer and, and earthworms? Not that they have a, a unbreakable bond, but I think I've read at least that they've, uh, they've seen some correlations between deer populations um, linking up with earthworm populations. No, I haven't personally studied earthworms. Um, I, I do know that earthworms have been found to facilitate increases in invasive plant species mm -hmm. and have also been associated with declines of native plants and, and even amphibians and other wildlife species as well. Okay. Um, but I'm not aware of any direct connection between the earthworms and deer per se. Yeah. I think they're both just having um, major effects on, on these the, the same victims are our native plants. Mm. I'll have to look that guy up and find it and share it in our, our Facebook right. group. And I, would, see. I would like to see that. I know I heard something about it, and I, it just popped in my head, oh, yeah, this whole earthworm thing. But G Given our predicament with where we're at with deer populations, especially here in New Jersey, um, is there anything that can be done to fix the problem? Is, are we too far past where we can fix it um, w without a predator? No, I think – 
I think there's a lot that we can do, and partly it depends on what scale you're talking about. You know, if you're thinking about the state as a whole, obviously there's different kinds of policies and initiatives we have to think about than if you're thinking about managing a, a preserve system, you know, a county park system or something like that, or a township preserve system. And similarly, there's different kinds of things that you can implement at the local level in your own property if you're just trying to, you know, create a little Noah's Ark or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is you're trying to grow in, in your yard, um, there's different tools and techniques you can use. Well, what, um, so, what, say, say, a. uh, uh a uh, homeowner with a heavy near a heavy deer population what what can they do to to protect their landscapes well the most effective thing you can do is just create a physical barrier and keep the deer out you know and so deer exclosures in a, a fence of some sort um is by far the most effective thing you can do to successfully grow plants especially native mm -hmm. plants and and tasty vegetables um unfortunately that can be expensive on larger scales and yeah. so um for you know larger preserves of thousands of acres and such, it's really difficult to find the funding to, to install a deer exclosure. And then on, on top of that, at the larger level, you know, we don't want to necessarily keep deer out completely. The deer are part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. They help, you know, create niches for other species to occur in the forest when they're at the proper levels. So it's kind of tricky to think about how to manage them above, you know, small scales in your own garden or your property. But for the homeowner, that's clearly the, the most effective thing you can do. And there's a lot of different types of fencing that might make it more affordable for the, the landowner. You know, we typically, when we create deer exclosures for local parks and, uh, and on, our, on our campus at the college, we've used the eight-foot plastic fencing. I'm not a big fan of plastic, but it's really easy to install mm -hmm. and to repair, and it's much more affordable in ways that we couldn't have afforded for the, the welded wire and metal fencing that is more durable, but it's much more difficult and expensive. Yeah, we, we've seen a lot of... Uh People use the tubex tree shelters um, while the plants are young to allow them to grow up to a height that that they'd be safe for a lot of trees. Um, you know, even the the New Jersey uh, Turnpike um, they changed their specs for native plants. I think they want them to be six to eight foot tall so that the apical meristem is taller than what a deer will browse uh, typically. Yeah. So they they try to attack it with just size if they put it in big enough. You know, it doesn't prevent it from buck rub, but if you use other tree guards, things like that, I know. I think it may be a combination of just all these things, mm -hmm. unfortunately, to uh, to get some success. Um, well, it's a lot, you know, if, if you're trying to restore a forest on your property, um, it's much more efficient to keep the deer out and let the trees plant themselves mm -hmm. than it is to plant trees and protect them individually. You know, our yeah. research is, we've, we've looked at a number of deer exclosures that have been up for 10 or 20 years in New Jersey, and in a deer exclosure, after four to five years, you get about 4,000 young trees per acre wow. in that forest. And there's no way you, you can plant <laughs> yeah. 4,000 trees per acre in any kind of cost-effective manner. And even if you can afford it, you're going to be doing tons of soil disturbance and everything mm -hmm. else in the process, too. So the, the, really, the forests are much better at restoring themselves if we can just bring the deer levels you know, in check. Um, and I think that's true for you know, stewardship of our forests and public open spaces and parks as well. And, and this is a very passionate subject to a lot of people too because there are people that are against hunting. That's not their values. Mm -hmm. They don't believe in that. So um, that's that's. – I'm sure that has to be tough – from a state level has to be tough to navigate as well. Yeah, there's a very vocal minority of people that um, strongly object to hunting uh, for any reason and of any kind. Um you know, I'm sympathetic to those views. I was vegetarian myself for 20 years, and I had really strong um, perspectives about that. But I think that the the need to manage the deer population really is an animal rights issue. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at the loss of millions of songbirds and butterflies and insects that belong in these forests, plant species, all, you know, every deer that you remove from the forest, you're allowing thousands of other creatures to live there be because that's um, what the deer are taking away from us. So I don't really understand the, you know, from from an ecosystem perspective, um, I, those views don't seem particularly leg legitimate to me because it really is about mm -hmm. enhancing the lives of these ecosystems and allowing more life to occur there. And then, you know, unfortunately, death is a part of nature, and it allows for, you know, life to occur. And in this case, because things are, are uh, you know, the deer numbers are growing unchecked, it's preventing the lives of countless more animals and plants out there that 
we really need to return to these places if, if we want to keep these species around and keep these ecosystems functioning the way they should be. I, I agree. I, you know, obviously our ecosystem's out of balance. Um, and, and it and typically <laughs> in, a, in a functioning ecosystem, it would balance itself out. But we removed the apex predators. Um, so it, it's not going to easily balance itself out and you're, you're getting that cascade effect uh, down. So it's I would I would like to see it balance. And, you know, my concern, even if, if you're able to fence areas up and keep deer out, you're just pushing them to other areas. Um, and I don't know if that will limit their number or just make things worse in other areas. It, it could increase the amount of of car accidents. <laughs> I, I think you'd have to fence off huge areas mm -hmm. to see any kind of major effects in that regard, and okay. I just don't think that's really realistic. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody's putting up fences in terms of many square miles to the point where it actually increased local deer numbers that significantly where you see those kinds of effects. Okay. You can see effects uh, on really small scales, like you know, uh, in the perimeter of a deer exclosure, you'll see increased browse and increased trampling as the deer walk around the fence. But um, it doesn't really impact adjacent properties or anything else because the deer numbers are already so excessive in those places that um, the devastation is going to occur either way. Now, are, are, are you aware of, like, where we're at, deer are a problem? We know there's areas where it's a larger problem. There are areas that it doesn't seem to be affecting in New Jersey. Are, there's, are there areas where people are like, we, we don't have a deer problem? Um, there are lower levels of deer in places where there is intact um, forest ecosystems that are not as fragmented. So whether you're down in the Pine Barrens mm -hmm. or up in the forest in the Highlands or on the Kittatinny Ridge, because there's less edge, it tends to support fewer deer. Um, and then in the Pine Barrens, you also have just kind of nutrient-poor ecosystems, and that translates into lower wildlife populations in some cases than in other places as well. But even in those places, we're still seeing levels of deer that are that are too high compared to historic levels and what we need the, the deer populations to be at. So we've done a, a number of deer surveys, surveys up in the mountains in, in these vast forested parts of northern New Jersey, and we're still seeing deer populations between 40 and, or 20 to 60 per square mile. Uh, and although we haven't done surveys in the Pine Barrens, I do a lot of research with rare plant species like swamp pink and other mm -hmm rare plants all over the place, and Swamp Pink's number one threat at this point is, is browse from deer. We're seeing wow. mm -hmm. the, the vast majority of Swamp Pink populations, I surveyed 80 of them um, in the past 10 years, and almost all of them are experiencing severe browse damage, and a lot of the populations now, the plants are only occurring on hummocks in the middle of rivers where the deer have a harder mm -hmm. time to get to them. Everything on the banks and any place that the deer can get to it, the Swamp Pink is declining. So we really have in New Jersey at least, across the board, a deer problem, although it's certainly more of a problem in some places than it is in others. Um, when you leave New Jersey, uh, it's, you know, it's more complicated. You've got large areas in Pennsylvania and New York where it's intact, contiguous forests and much less edge, um, and so there might be lower deer populations in some of those places. If you go up into the Great Lakes region, there's actually still wolves present there, and so things mm -hmm. might be in better balance in parts of you know, upper Michigan and so forth. Um, but really, we're seeing the same kinds of impacts to forests in New Jersey as you can find anywhere, at least from Boston down to D.C. The entire Northeast Corridor is experiencing more or less the same kinds of changes to the landscape, uh, and the deer populations have responded. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's it's not just here that, that the predators are gone. I mean, in Philadelphia, Aramingo Avenue, I believe, is the uh, Native American word for, like, running of the wolves or something like that area was was known for wolves and and, and there's there's no wolves there now <laughs> there's there, there's no open property there now and, and jay yeah. you keep bringing up uh edge habitat and i just friend i both know what that is i want to make sure all our listeners know what it is and um i guess the best way to put it is if you imagine you had a a 10 by 10 piece of grid paper in front of you well the edge would be that outside row on all, for the whole perimeter but now, say you took those same hundred squares, but you you basically laid them over like a housing development, so you have a little bit of woods here and a little bit of woods there, and well, now you've increased that edge, so that perimeter is much, much wider, while the interior section, the, the section that isn't touching as something outside of that square, is now a lot smaller. 
Um, probably hard for me to demonstrate that over over voice, but yeah, this is bad podcasting right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. But what makes that that interior forest less uh, less attractive for deer to live in? Uh, well, there um, is typically you know one of the major limiting factors for plant growth is sunlight, right? Mm-hmm. So in the interior of the forest, you can have typically much greater levels of shade, and so that's going to lead to less plant growth and so forth. On the edges, you've got sunlight hitting the, the ground itself, so you've got lush herbaceous vegetation that's within easy reach. You've got a, typically a dense wall of, of shrubs like blackberries and other uh, species that are also within the deer's ability to reach. You've got young trees growing up, so you just have much denser vegetation growth on the edge. And then out in the open, of course, as well, whether it's a farm field or somebody's yard, there's a lot more, much denser plant growth than there is within the interior of the forest. So it really just does boil down to, to food and cover. Yep. Huh? All right. All right. Now, as, as, as a homeowner, and this is a loaded question because I, I know I can't answer this question, yeah. and we get asked this and it's question. The, yeah, the, the time. probably the number one question we get asked. Are there native plants that, that deer don't like? In in my in my experience, I've seen them eat everything depending on available food. So yeah. it's I, I just think maybe there's species that they prefer less. Um, yeah, and I don't know if you have any suggestions as far as plant species um, that they like. I think I, you know I've seen them eat sweet pepper bush last, but then areas where they were devastated because there was nothing else there. Yeah, so I, I agree. From my experience, it's it's really just a matter of degree. So the, the more deer there are in the area, the less there is for them to eat, and the more pressure there's going to be to eat anything at all that's available to them. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening. So even things that actually have poisons in them, like milkweeds that have latex mm-hmm. uh, and other things, the deer will eat them. <laughs> you know, They're not deer resistant. When the deer numbers get to be 100 per square mile, you're going to get your milkweeds eaten by deer. And you'd never see that when deer, you know, deer numbers are lower and they've got a greater diversity of plants to choose from. Um, so typically it's plants that have chemical defenses or repellents in them, whether it's poisons like latex that you find in milkweeds or um, aromatic chemicals like you find in many mint species uh, or other species that have kind of more pungent aromas. Um, the one that comes to mind is poison hemlock, but that's obviously not native. But yeah. things of that kind, you know, can, can be pretty good repellents, um, that will do more than other, do better than other plants, uh, everything else being equal. The other kind of group of plants that you um, tend to see less impacts to are species that have mechanical defenses, like really nasty thorns. So bull thistle, for example, is usually one of the last species in, in meadows to survive when deer populations get to be too high. It'll be nothing but, you know, bull thistle and grease grass because they, they have either chemical or a mechanical defenses but ultimately the deer will eat those too if there's nothing else to eat so you, there's a you know two thousand different plant species in new jersey and quite a number of them have uh defenses of either of those kinds chemical or mechanical that can do something at least to repel deer um especially if you know if your town or your p- parks nearby are doing a good job at managing deer populations and bringing their numbers down those uh that'll have an impact on what you can you're able to grow in your yard. But, you know, that's not particularly satisfying to only grow things that are poisonous or <laughs> nasty to touch. Um, so there's other things you could do, aside from putting up a full-blown deer exclosure and, you know, fencing out the wild world from your backyard. Deer also don't like to jump into small enclosed spaces. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my town has 130 deer per square mile, and I refuse to give up growing vegetables, but I also don't want to put an 8-foot deer fence, you know, in my backyard. So I put in a little four foot fence around my small 20 to 20 foot garden and the deer just don't won't jump into it and so it you know really and same thing with landscape plants if you just put a small border around those plants whether it's you know against your house um or in you know small enclosures islands in your yard whatever it is that you're trying to, to grow and manage if it's a relatively small space the deer are averse to jumping into those kinds of places and so you might have better luck with simple um measures like that that are going to be much uh, more visually appealing and less, you know, expensive uh, and difficult to install and maintain. Uh, thank you. I was unaware yeah. of that. That's that's great. Yeah. And great. and it's also interesting um, 
so we do a lot with the wildflower seed and one of the issues we have is with deer eating specifically smooth aster they just it seems to be the only they'll eat a couple other species but that's one that they it's just a magnet for the deer they all come and eat that species and really do a lot of damage to it uh, when i've talked to other seed producers in other parts of the country well they have all have their own few things that the deer seem to favor and uh even some of them we usually recommend um the minardas to be more right. deer resistant well i've talked to other seed producers who said oh they love the minarda fistulosa and they don't touch the the smooth aster at all so i think yeah. some of it is just where you are as well it, it's not there's no silver bullet for this it's it, it has yep. been such an interesting year for us for years we we have had no deer damage on our nursery uh or very mm -hmm. very little and we have 300 preserved acres that surround us mm -hmm. um, as a nursery and just this past year we're getting uh buck rub they're actually eating of all the things they're going to <laughs> into our greenhouses and eating smooth cord grass our native uh salt marsh bay grass and they're yeah. they're finding that uh very very tasty mm -hmm. so it's uh it's just really interesting that the trends here because we went from saying oh we never have deer damage yeah and yet. it was hard to answer that question when someone said oh yeah what's deer resistant oh we haven't really had any trials <laughs> no, <laughs> because I, they aren't they aren't here no but even um, things like you mentioned mechanical uh defenses like ilex yeah. opaca maybe isn't something because of the spiny uh Mm -hmm. leaves they wouldn't go after but i've seen a harsh enough winter where they've decimated yeah. american holly and jay when you were just talking about the the deer exclosures it reminded me of i think it was the first class i ever went to in college it was like a biology 101 class and we actually walked around the woods and did a, a fern um identification unit and um but they had a deer exclosure and uh, the professor was even telling us about how they had on a, this is in upstate New York, but in especially harsh winters when they got lots of snow, they'd have a lot of deer that died because they starved to death, but their stomachs were always full, and they were just eating all kinds of twigs and hemlock boughs and all different kinds of things just to try and get some nutrition um, because there wasn't any available to them. They just wouldn't stop eating just because there wasn't something there to eat that was nutritional to them. They just kept trying to find something. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of mind-boggling to think about what it's like, how much the deer need to eat during the winter time to survive. And a cold winter, I mean, just picture yourself outside with only a thick coat of fur on, trying to come up with enough energy to sleep through a really cold night. And there's, you know, if you've ever gone on a diet and tried to live off of nothing but salad, that's hard enough, like <laughs> keeping yourself full. They don't even have salad to eat. They've got buds and twigs where the amount of, like, digestible material is really minuscule mm -hmm. in the stuff that they're eating. So you think about how many of those twigs and buds and whatever's out there in the wintertime, those poor animals have to eat to get enough energy to survive. I mean, it must be acres worth of these plants. Yes. Um, and I think that's what, what really helps me think about, you know, the impact that a single animal is going to be having out there. Just picturing myself <laughs> trying to eat enough <laughs> salad to survive through a cold night and then taking the, the, the step away from that to think about, all right, well, what if I just had buds and twigs to eat? How much harder would it be even than that? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that for me, that puts that in perspective. Yeah, all that all that transference of energy that they would get from, say, perennials that aren't there come winter, so their whole their whole diet mm -hmm. has to change or or mostly change yeah. over the winter. And and while we're on yeah. the topic of deer food, what's what is something that they like to eat? What are some plants they prefer over uh, over other plants? Uh, well, most of the studies that have looked at this uh, immediately point to species in the lily family. Trillium and different lily species just get whacked right away. Um, in terms of trees, deer love to eat hemlocks, actually. Um, they Even very low levels of deer will start to impact hemlock regeneration in the northern forests. Um, but they are generalists, so it's, it's not easy to, to say with all that much certainty that this is the number one preferred plant. But we are seeing impacts to really a, a, an incredible wide array of our species. So many of our flock species in New Jersey are now endangered, and I think mm -hmm. one of the main drivers of that is the deer population. And all you have to do is try to grow flocks in your backyard around here to find out how much deer like to eat that species. Um, so it's, you know, there are certain orchids that the deer like to eat, although others they seem to not prefer as much. Um, and in some cases it's not the entire plant. It might just be a certain part of the plant mm -hmm. or at a certain uh, time in its life cycle when the you know the plant's full of energy and about to open its its buds 
deer will eat them at that point, but after the flower is out, they will just walk right away from it and not touch it. So it's it's highly variable and uh, difficult to kind of point your finger at and say, you know, these species first, then these species, and so forth, because there's so many other factors that come into play, whether it be seasonality, local uh, food availability, the, the deer numbers, time of year, and so forth. I, I think it's funny you mentioned lilies and trillium just because – that's not something I even really see anymore. So mm-hmm. it's it yeah. makes sense. Uh, I, I guess you could say they love maple leaf viburnum because yeah. <laughs> they yeah. they basically for just, sure. No, in terms of the shrub part. layer, it's viburnum is number one. Mm-hmm. And um, but you know it's the same thing. Spice bush has got you know, really fragrant um, twigs and leaves, and the deer will leave that alone at first. But then the deer numbers get high enough, and they're they're going to start to eat the spice bush just as much as anything else. Um, so they'll start with the tastiest, the easiest things to eat, and then they kind of move on from there. Is there any new study or any misconception that the general public should know? Um, just, I mean, we've discussed a lot, but is there any anything groundbreaking or any new theories that that or or something that the general public, like we talked about, loss of habitat being a factor, and it's not as big of a factor as we think? Is there is there any? misconception or or thought that you would like to share with the general public just as um uh, as they should know um i mean the, the com- most common misconception is the one that we already talked about that you know that hunting um and and reduction of deers is is an animal rights concern mm-hmm. you know that it really is from that perspective that I think we need to manage deer mm-hmm. because it's supporting the greater life of these ecosystems that the deer are are um, degradating. Uh, besides that, um, you know, just thinking about it in a bigger perspective that it's not just about the plants in your yard and and so forth, but it's about the ecosystems that we're a part of as a whole. And beginning to think about the connections that we have to how we're managing our, our landscapes in our yard and how that's affecting the surrounding forests and, and the ecosystems that all these other creatures are beginning that are need to depend on for their survival. So what you plant in your yard makes a huge difference for what ends up in the forest next door. And supporting, you know, deer management um, is really critical for us to begin to re- recover the the quality of our habitats in New Jersey. So going beyond like our own self-interest and what we're trying to get our yards to look like, you really need to support efforts to manage deer in your local park systems and your local townships because these are controversial issues, um, but largely because it is that vocal minority of people that are um, making things difficult for local officials and park managers to do what needs to be done to bring these ecosystems back into place. So being vocal and getting involved and trying to support initiatives uh, at the local level or the state level for that matter are, are really critical to um, helping to move move forward and, and restore our ecosystems in the way that we need to. Mm. And I really feel this is a man-made problem. This, this problem occurs uh, because of things that humans have done because I think generally in nature, in healthy ecosystems, predators don't, don't they won't wipe out their prey. <laughs> you know, there's a balance. They the, they right. they may fluctuate where there's more predators at this time and more prey at this time, but they they coexist. We're the only species that wipes out. <laughs> you know, I think we're the only species that will wipe out other species. Mm-hmm. Totally. So it's yeah. You know, we're really the equivalent of a meteor hitting this planet in terms of what we're doing to the biodiversity of life on Earth, mm-hmm. and we really need to start thinking more seriously about how. We conduct ourselves individually and as a society if we want to keep all these species around with us into the future mm-hmm. and not deprive future generations of all the wonders and joys that they have to offer for us. It's, our, it's a failure of our own awareness and intelligence to, uh, to appreciate what we have and, and not to ruin it um, because that's what's happening right now in some, in some ways directly, in some ways like with deer indirectly. And we, you know, it, it is a mandate. I, I agree with you. It's it's uh and I think we're at levels unseen levels mm-hmm. of this where we're we're starting to see so many areas that that need to be fixed um, because like like you were saying if it's it's not just one thing that they're they're depleting forests of understory but all the other species or insects that depend on those mm-hmm. that are now in decline you know it, it seems like no matter who we have on and what we talk about it's in decline yeah. <laughs> except yeah. deer. except for deer, deer. Not in de- <laughs> yeah except for deer but but it, you know but it's not hopeless you know and and mm-hmm. it there's there's 
if anything, there's opportunities for people to get involved and for good work to be done. Uh, and it really is essential if we want a future that's <laughs> worth passing on. But for as far as deer management goes, you know, we've had lots of conservation groups and local towns and park systems that have taken this issue seriously in the past 20 years and have had really good results in managing the deer populations and bringing them down to a level where we're starting to see really significant improvements in local ecosystem qualities. And not just that, but reductions in deer vehicle collisions, mm -hmm. benefits for local farming and landscaping, uh, and so forth. So if you go to Duke Farms, for example, it's about a you know, two or 3,000 acre preserve in Hillsborough in, in Somerset County. They've been managing deer for the past 15 years or so, and they've actually been able to bring it down to uh, 10 deer per square mile mm -hmm. within their large deer exclosure. And then outside the exclosure, they've brought it down to about 30 per square mile. And if you go into that preserve and you walk the trails there, you can't see five feet into the forest mm -hmm. because they're just so full of young trees growing and shrubs returning and the native vegetation bounces back all on its own without any planting whatsoever. And it's, you know, with all they did was just bring deer back in, under control. And, and that's not a simple matter. It takes a lot of effort and energy and a lot of um, the right incentives being put in place to, to make it work. Um, they, but they've done it, and, and we can see the ecosystem restoring itself as a result. And many other places have done that as well. Uh, so I think there's opportunities here, and the more people can, that can get involved and educate themselves and get active locally to try to bring um, the deer population under control, the more of these kind of benefits we're going to see returning to us. Uh, in the, the natural world around us. Very well said. We actually had the folks from Duke Farms on, and we yeah. discussed their deer management plan. Yeah, and, uh, and if people at home haven't listened to that, that was episode two. That was our, our first and only in-studio podcast guest. <laughs> it was. That was the only one where we had guests in the studio. But we, we actually uh, discussed their yeah. deer management program at great length, and it's very successful. And mm -hmm. it's, I think it's it's a good... Um, it's a good roadmap yeah, for, yeah. for other places like that, which there's... More than one would think. There's a lot of preserves and and sanctuaries, I guess, is that can utilize that roadmap. Because that's not an area that's void of deer. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. All right, Jay. We we end every. Oh, we're not done yet, friend. Oh, I had, I had one more thing, and this is oh, something I'm okay. stealing from another podcast. All right, all right. But I'm gonna <laughs> I'm rephrasing Sorry. it here. So. Jay, if you were the supreme leader of the, the state, world, country, whatever you want to make it, um, and now we have Dr. Jay Kelly is the supreme leader, and he's going to fix no the thanks. deer problem. I'm in, not interested. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to fix the deer problem in New Jersey. What's what's your plan for deer? Yeah, to, just to, to, to bring us back to to I guess nineteen seventy levels. We won't hold you to this. <laughs> um, so you're asking me if I had the ability to do anything if, necessary to control the deer population, what would I do? Yes. if you if We, we got to bring it back to like 19, was it 1972, I think you said, when they, they got it back up to those levels. Or was that when they introduced them? I don't remember. But, um, yeah, what would you do if you had complete control, what would you do to bring deer levels back to that healthy level? Uh, geez, there's there's a lot of things that could change. You know, I think it's <laughs> if people were willing, the 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 thing that would make me happy is just bringing wolves back to New Jersey. As, as difficult as that might be, and and maybe infeasible for political or even biological reasons, that probably would be enough to do the trick. But if that didn't work, um, trying to create better incentives and greater awareness within the hunter community about how hunting can actually be a service to society. It's not just about filling your fridge with meat and putting a, a trophy on the wall. You're actually benefiting forests and public health and public safety as a result. And I think if we went back to the 1970s and did something to change hunter perspectives to start managing for does instead of for bucks mm -hmm. and keeping the levels at that at that you know 10 per square mile or so that we had back then, creating incentives to try to get more people hunting and um, and so forth. I think that could that could have done a, a world of good. In the world we have today, you know, where we're at 100 per square mile or so on average, um, you know, we clearly need to do a lot more than just uh, support recreational hunting because it's mm -hmm. it, the the task is much greater than 
the casual hunter can really accomplish. And so whether it's a matter of changing incentive systems and policies to uh, subsidize the hunting that goes on, uh, to encourage hunters to take more than they personally need, and you know, there's great programs where you can donate uh, deer meat to a program called Hunters Helping the Hungry where the food gets sent to local food pantries. Um, there's ways that towns and the state could subsidize that that they're not doing currently. That could do a world of good. And there's even some talk that I think is worth exploring about returning to some sort of regulated commercial hunting system where there's actually economic incentives for hunters to take more than what they personally need. Mm -hmm. And that could be a dangerous game to play because that's what led to deer being more or less less exterminated throughout most of their range in the past. But if it was regulated and monitored and conducted carefully, I think there's some hope that that could come to good as well. I'm just going to throw something out there just for for people at home who might not probably don't know this but if uh if you're at a restaurant or you're um even buying a pack of beef, beef jerky and it says venison on it it's actually not uh our local deer it's actually uh, typically it's red deer or some kind of um uh other deer from somewhere elsewhere in the world because it's illegal i think across the entire united states to trade in game meats you can't buy or sell them in any way it's legal to serve them wow um so well, I, keep that in mind when, I, when you're looking gonna, at that stuff. I was going to say when when I worked at Princeton Nurseries, which was three thousand acres in, it stretched over Mercer, Monmouth, and uh, Ocean County. It was kind of where they meet. And the deer deprivation permits we had, those deer after they were shot had to be you had to dig a pit mm-hmm. and bury them. Yeah. So you couldn't sell the food, you couldn't give the food away. Yeah. And it's no longer the case anymore. Okay, that but, was um, that's going back like fifteen yeah, years. Yeah, now it's they, they encourage you to give it to to hungers or hunters helping the hungry or uh, different food shelters and those kind of things. But people were so fanatical yeah. and upset over that that they were chopping down our trees and leaving yeah. signs saying deer killers. So they were destroying nature as well yeah. you know they were still destroying a living but, uh, living thing but jay i was i'm really happy you brought up the the whole hunting aspect of it because growing up in a rural community where i i've hunted all my life but that was kind of what we were always taught is oh you don't shoot does because that could be the the fawns that it gives birth to could be the next big buck and you always want to shoot the big buck and um i don't want to give away too much of what our our uh, next guest is gonna talk about but um there his whole organization's mantra is is really can having healthy deer herds not necessarily uh and when you have healthy deer herds that's when you get bigger deer or more um the horns don't really matter in the grand scheme of things yeah. but it's they'll actually go and go to properties and say hey you have 100 deer per square mile or 50 deer per square mile or, and you have of those 100 uh 25 of them are bucks and 75 are does you really want it to be 50 50 so you need to kill this many does for every buck you kill and that's part of their management strand or management plans that they give out to some of these these properties so it is changing it's not changing across the hunting community as a whole and that's uh so i was happy you brought that up because that really ties in to where we're going next time it does it's perfect all right do you have anything else Tom? uh i have one more thing okay but I might save it for a final thought. Let me think right, real you quick. Save it? Yeah, I'll save it for a final okay, thought. Okay. So, That's... so Jay, we we always end every podcast with one final question. It's always the same question, and it's a very simple one. And it's although a lot of people have trouble answering this one, they really yeah. do because maybe it's not as simple as as I think. But uh, what is your favorite native plant? Uh, you're not going to get me to pick a favorite. I am way too in love with way too many plants. Uh, I am polyamorous as far as my love of plants goes, and I'm not going to pick favorites amongst them. They're they're just okay. amazing, and I'm constantly blown away by their their uh, their beauty and splendor. So that's that, that's all you're getting out of me. All right, that that is a very common answer, though. That's we we get that answer a lot. We we get we get a lot more people. You know, it's whatever one I'm looking at now, or they'll narrow it down to like one tree, one shrub. But I will accept that answer. I won't. I I can truly appreciate that. Uh, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, Jay, we allow everyone just to have a final thought. Also, just if just to wrap things up, uh, if there's anything you'd like to say, or just anything you want to touch back on. Um, now's your now's your time. Well, you know, I think we've already said this a couple times. 
maybe less directly, but, you know, our forests and other ecosystems really are at a tipping point, and um, we need people to get involved and to start taking these issues seriously at home and in their towns and their parks and even at the national level. You know, the extinction crisis that's happening right now is a local crisis. It's not just in Africa on the savannas. It's not just in the oceans. This is a global phenomenon, and it's a preventable phenomenon. And the more people we have that are engaged and informed and willing to get off their butts and turning off their screens to do something good in the world, I think the more we're going to have to pass on to future generations and the less they're going to be shaking their heads at us wondering what we were doing allowing all this to continue. Um, so thank you very much again for the work you're doing and for uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to sh to share a little bit about this this concern uh, to the general public because I think it really is um, a, a critical thing for people to consider and to get involved with. And I think they know that. Just like we said, it's one of our most requested topics mm -hmm. for the podcast. So uh, we really appreciate you coming on and be able to shed some light because I I never f fail to learn something new every time we do this. Tom, do you want me to go next, or do you want to go? It doesn't matter to me. Because I don't have much, so I can go. Okay, next. yeah, you if can you go. Have the big, since yeah. you saved But the, it's not even a <laughs> big final thought. It's, it's. <laughs> you know, it's – it. I, I keep looking at this. You know, this when this podcast started off, you know, the focus was native plants and our, our study and our – our views and topics keep getting broader and broader and broader, although they're all interconnected. And it's it's really the health of our ecosystem and, and where we're going and what we can do to fix it. And and, 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 and you're going to see that coming up on future uh, episodes of the podcast because we're going in directions that I don't think we ever conceived we would go in um, when we started mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, and, and it's 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 still plant based or, or it's it's ecology based but you know we're going to talk about oceans ocean health and and things like that so it's just i it's this whole thing has really helped me to to look at a lot much larger scale than just right here in our backyards and what we're doing so that's you know and every guest has really given me an education on on what we know and what we do or what we can do so i i'm appreciative of that all right, it's, it. up it's up to me. Mine's you. not very deep. <laughs> mine, mine was deep. <laughs> it, it, every time we talk about deer, or and I shouldn't say we, anytime I talk about deer, and especially specifically deer management or deer control, it always is amazing to me that even with like hunting, uh, with I know there's all these like contraceptive programs that have happened in in different parts of the Northeast, which. I probably should have asked you about those. I don't know if you know anything about the the things they've tried with contraceptives with deer. Uh, the contraceptives can be effective when you've got captive deer populations and you're trying to keep them from you know uh, reproducing you know in a in a zoo, for example, or if you have a, a captive herd uh, on a farm or something. But in the wild, where uh, you've got deer moving across the landscape over great distances. It really um, seems to be infeasible for it to work mm -hmm. um, because to, for it to work, a lot of the contraceptives have to be reapplied every year or every couple of years, and so you have to actually tag the deer and then keep track of which ones you've inoculated with the contraceptives, um, and that ends up being really expensive uh, to do and and has had limited effectiveness. So the, the places and the, the studies that I've seen that have actually experimented with that in the past, it hasn't been successful. And and on top of that, it's been far more expensive than, than actual effective deer management has been, using hunting mm. of various kinds. Um, there's apparently new generation you know, pharmaceuticals that people are experimenting with now and surgical sterilization and other things, but um, I have little faith that those are really going to accomplish what we need to, given the levels of deer that we have. So you know when every town has got thousands of deer now to to manage the the prospect of being able to tag and and inoculate every one of them or a substantial portion of them um really doesn't seem to be to be a feasible challenge if we get deer populations down low enough eventually where um it would take less work to manage them that way maybe that's more feasible but we're not there yet and i don't think it's productive to think about it just because we don't like the idea of killing something, you know? Yeah. And while while it may be unsavory to, to picture killing large numbers of deer to bring their numbers down, 
I can't imagine why it's okay to think about surgical sterilization as something that is humane or appealing in any way. That's that seems to be to be equally gruesome and full of all kinds of potential unknown consequences for the the well-being of these animals. So. Um, you know, I haven't seen any research that indicates that those programs and techniques have been successful. Everything that I've seen has shown them to be not only less effective, but more expensive, mm -hmm. and far more expensive at that. Um, you know, typical deer management programs will cost about 20 to to $100 per deer for hunting. If it's sharpshooters, you're talking about 100 to $200 per deer. Contraceptives are between 400 and $1,000 per deer uh, to be applied. And um, that's just, there's no way that our towns and parks have enough money to even afford that. Okay. That backed up what I was <laughs> what I was going with it. So that was good. But between hunters, sharpshooters, the contraceptive programs, our number one weapon against uh, deer overpopulation has still been cars. And that just blows me away when you start thinking about all these other control methods that we're, we're trying to use, that it's, it's cars have been the most effective. So it's... We need to we need to come up with something better, and I think what you've been talking about is that something better. So I agree. I agree. It would be cool to have wolves around here. I agree. I agree. But uh, you know, also an issue. But, <laughs> yeah. but it would be, it would be uh, cool until someone got got eaten by a wolf. But then it wouldn't be so. Anyway, thank you all again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to Native Plans. Uh, no. Yeah. But Fran, I Man. just got to quit on this. Man. We hope yeah. you enjoyed listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast and uh, and Dr. Jay Kelly from Raritan Valley Community College. Uh, make sure you look up his research and, uh, and any research you can find on, on deer habitat. And I'm going to put up that... Uh, that deer and, and earthworms thing the link right. awesome. i found it when we were when we were talking there a little bit so i've put that in our facebook group um again thank you guys for listening to the podcast and uh all right you you yeah. can listen to the native plants uh healthy planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com you can also check us out at podbean itunes spotify google play stitcher tune in iheart radio youtube or you can just ask alexa to play the native plants healthy planet podcast uh, we're going to give a big thanks to Stephen Mahar for contributing to our theme music. You can follow us at, on Twitter at Pinelands Nursery, uh, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery and J, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and oh, Twitter is actually Pineland Nursery. I'm, I've been screwing yeah. that up too. We yeah. got to switch back. You, I like I like uh, the other like way better. All right, next episode <laughs> we'll 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 switch it back. Uh, go check out our YouTube channel, which is also at Pinelands Nursery, and. I mentioned it a couple times. Join our our Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of a lot of good conversations in there, and I'm expecting a lot of good conversations to become of this podcast when when it's released. So uh, let's keep that conversation going. Thanks again. I'm Tom, and I am Fran. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much. Uh, I I love this episode. Thank you for for last minute agreeing to uh, to speak with us today. It was my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, no no problem. And thanks thanks again, everyone. We'll see everyone next time. Until then, keep it native. Stay tuned for more of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Welcome to episode 14 of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. Today is part two of two of our Dear Native Plant series. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezik. And before we get into the, the meat of the episode, Fran, I, you've really been knocking out a lot of hikes lately. So why don't you fill everyone in on, on where you've been going? We have been. You know, and, and we've we've kept it pretty local. So my fiance and I, since uh, quarantining at start and social distancing, once they've open parks back up pretty much every weekend we've been doing uh a different hike and um man i i it's it's tough to say which one is our favorite mm -hmm. and you know and we've done a lot that we've never been to we've done some that we've been to plenty of times um I, i'm wondering you know blueberry hill i know mm -hmm. I, I recommended that to you blueberry hill in uh gibbsboro new jersey uh was a great one um What's the Hicken Valley Park in Philadelphia? Very historical. Hmm. A lot of really cool features of that one. And you yeah, can make cool. it easy if you want, or you can make it difficult. Like you can walk along the water on a big stone road, mm -hmm. or you can go through the woods. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's good. But um, 
you know, the nice thing about that park too, if you pick the right spot, you're parked right outside of Delisandro's cheesesteak. Yeah. So you can <laughs> <laughs> nice little post hike treat. Yeah, post hike. You're you're hungry, you can pick up a cheesesteak and it, one of my favorites also. But and I know you were asking about you you texted me this weekend about stroller fest, all the recommendations yeah, yeah, I, I gave you. We wanted to go on Sunday and I slept great Saturday night and was up early ready to go, but uh uh, my wife didn't sleep as well. <laughs> so, we just had a baby, so it's I think yeah, it was one month old on Saturday. So it's uh, it's still a learning curve for us and figuring out who's waking up when. And I've had those yeah. mornings too where I'm, there's, I'm not there, ready to there's, go. There's going to be a lot more of those. Yeah, but Saturday we went to we're we're lucky. We actually talked about it here before about having a great county park system, and we have a county trail that runs almost right behind our house, uh, the Concora Trail. We went walk that, and I took a bunch of pictures and put them on iNaturalist and. Awesome. Saw some cool stuff. That's a great stroller friendly yes, walk yeah, nice too. And paid. I, I really yeah, let me think about it before you ask me again. Let me think <laughs> about it. So because I was replaying the hikes in my head, I'm like, ooh, if I had to push a stroller through here, yeah. I might be really upset. So, <laughs> but but looking back at our last episode, part one of the, the deer and native plants theme, um, we had Dr. J. Kelly on. And it was really fascinating talk and took some turns I wasn't always expecting. And um, and if you haven't listened to that, I'd urge you to go back and, and play it right now before listening to this because I think this is a good continuation of that that episode. Okay. So, and, and we're back. Did you listen to it? Did everyone listen to it? I think uh, we listened to more than one. Th- yeah, that we <laughs> man, that was a really long – I think you guys listened to a ton of episodes. Well, I'm glad you're all caught up. Uh, it's amazing to me really how this podcast has progressed since we first imagined it and had the idea towards the end of last year. We really wanted to showcase scientific nonprofit organizations that all of you could get involved with. Yeah, and I really think we've tried to emphasize the science from the beginning. We wanted to come at it from a scientific lens, and unfortunately in today's culture that's not always the case. People want to believe the science that supports what they like and um, – it, we might present some things to you that you don't necessarily agree with, but we don't want you to just blindly ignore it. We want you to be cognizant of it and help it form your opinion. And we don't want you to blindly agree either. Have yeah. your own opinion. You you can agree or disagree with us. That's great. We're just trying to bring you all the all the different angles. Yeah, and there's a lot of science going on with with white-tailed deer and um, and with hunting regulations and just wildlife management as a whole. And uh, and that's some of the stuff that we're pre- trying to present to you through this whole deer conversation. So, um, speaking of science, we uh, <laughs> did you see the new company called Resting Risk Face? I hadn't. No. So it, I thought it was really interesting because they, since I, I just got a new iPhone 11 that has um, facial recognition, and when you're wearing a mask, it doesn't work. So uh, they said they would actually print your face on a mask so that it would work with your iPhone (laughs) facial recognition. But then you go through the whole thing, and at the end, they just go like, ha-ha, it's a joke. Wash your hands, get a vaccine. (laughs) So, (laughs) wah, wah, wah. Uh, If you're a member of our Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook page, you probably have a good idea of what's coming. Uh, As I mentioned before, we wanted to bring a diverse group of Native Plant enthusiasts to our table, and we've done a really good job of that. A few months ago, we spoke with Lou Gambali, president of New Jersey uh, National Wild Turkey Federation. And even though we had a really good discussion with Lou, we, we wanted to take this in a direction that we thought would hit even closer to home. This time, we're we're aiming for the fences, yeah. and that's the, the deer fences. <laughs> <laughs> so, And yeah, with, with Lou, we had a really good conversation, but it didn't hit all the points I think we were hoping to hit. And um, – and, a little story right after that episode we went back to work and i was out on the golf cart pulling some orders and uh listening to some of the podcasts that i always like to listen and uh, listen to and um i heard a representative from the quality deer management association and he's going on about all these great native plants and how you can use them in food plots and and how you, people really need to know their native plants especially when managing for deer so i got on my phone and i found the guy on instagram and i sent him a message and i <laughs> never heard anything back and uh, the next week, I actually heard another podcast with a different representative from that same organization, QDMA. And uh, I figured, you know, I'll try email this time. And I think I heard back within an hour or two. So, Kip, thank you for responding so quickly. I'm giving, I, I'm picking on Lindsay a little bit because he didn't answer me right away. And uh, <laughs> I, I just don't think he ever saw the message. But, um, but we're happy to have you here. And, and really, I think you're presenting a, a different lens that complements that last conversation we had with Dr. J. Kelly. Um, about how to manage deer herds. 
Well, 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 certainly. Thank you for having me, guys. Uh, I I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, I'm always up for talking deer. (laughs) (laughs) So um, before we get started, uh, from what I understand, uh, Quality Deer Management Association (laughs) recently merged with the National Deer Alliance. uh, And have you picked a new name yet? Do you know what? We have not. uh, So, But, yeah, very exciting times for us. so uh, we are super excited to be working much more closely together um, to be able to provide much more for, for deer and, and habitat management and hunters going forward. And uh, the next big thing is going to come up with our name. Uh, we know that we are keeping uh, the QDMA logo. Um, okay. A lot of history with that. Uh, you know, we're 32 years old, so uh, a lot of uh, accomplishments under that logo. Um, I think it's super cool that it has a buck and a doe, um, you know, rather than uh, some humongous buck only, you know, mm-hmm. to show that, yeah. hey, you have to manage. Uh, the female side so we have a logo no name yet <laughs> and and for listeners who aren't as familiar with qdma how did it start you said you've been you've been around for for 32 years what brought the qdma it really came about uh joe hamilton uh, is the founder at the time he was a wildlife biologist in, for the south carolina dnr and at that back Back in the late 80s, that was a time period where deer herds across much of the United States uh, were, were well above what the carrying capacity of the habitat was, and uh, and that was in large part because of how we hunted them. Uh, you know, we had been taught to, to protect does, uh, to shoot every buck you could, and now what that did is it allowed deer herds to just become too abundant. So uh, Joe's take on it was, hey, we, we need to be a, do a much better job uh, managing this. Let's remove some of that pressure from uh, those young bucks. Let's apply it to the analyst side. So we can be much better managers, so, you know, and balance these deer herds with the habitat, and then also allow a deer, uh, bucks and does, you know, to fill the age classes, so that it was a much more natural deer population, uh, you know, the way nature intended. So that's uh, that's how it started uh, as an educational organization to to teach people more about managing deer and and uh, deer habitat, and uh, to teach them to be better stewards of our natural resources. You know, it's funny because when we decided to do this two-part series we really thought they would be opposing views and then as we progress into this we're realizing it's really how closely linked they are Mm -hmm. they're not really opposing because with the last one we realized yeah we have a uh, a high deer density in many parts of new jersey and overpopulations but mainly because we've removed all the apex predators and we're not managing it properly um you know, and and if you're doing the right thing and you're planting native plants, you're you're bringing those deer in. You're you're working on the correct ecosystem. It's just not. It's missing something. Mm-hmm. So we're 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 excited that that I didn't know that's what my view was going to be <laughs> when we <laughs> yeah. started this, but it's it's closely working its way to that. So um, we're curious what kind of brought you to this this part of the world. Like what what brought you into uh, QDA. Well, I, I grew up in yeah, I grew up in, uh, in northern Pennsylvania. Um, very closely tied uh, to to the outdoors. Um, my father was a hunter. Uh, one of my grandfathers was. One of my grandmothers was. My uncles were. Uh, I grew up in a very rural place, and you know everybody I knew hunted. So it was just the most natural thing in the world. Uh, realized very early on that uh, that my passion lay there with uh, you know managing wildlife and then wanting to to do everything I could to to be a good steward of the land. So I uh, uh, went to college for it. Went to a graduate school for it. Um, ended up uh, in Florida, um, oh, a wild wow. place. So uh, at that time, and this is back in the, the early '90s, uh, you know, there were very few opportunities to be a wildlife biologist uh, outside of a state or, or federal agency. So uh, I got a job with the Florida Game and Fish Commission. Uh, worked there for four years. Uh, then uh, was offered the position of deer and bear project leader at New Hampshire. Uh, I had done my mm-hmm. graduate work at the University of New Hampshire, okay. so I had a chance to go back to the state and work for that state. And it was at that time that I learned about the QDMA, and uh, I became a member immediately, started getting uh, the educational resources, learning about what it was doing, loved the educational opportunities that it offered and how it was teaching hunters, and uh, decided it was time uh, um, to, uh, to leave state government. And uh, QDMA offered the first uh, position in the Northeast. And at that point, I was based out of Pennsylvania as a regional director that uh, covered the whole Northeastern U.S. So uh, I applied for it, um, got that, and uh, that was 18 years ago. Wow. So uh, been a great ride with the organization. <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of the first things I noticed actually looking at the website was the educational aspect. And it's it really 
– and we're going to go into this a little bit later too. It just really blew me away uh, with the educational aspect of mm-hmm. it, and I, I got a lot more out of it than I expected to. So, But – one of the things we wanted to start off asking, just since we're talking about deer and, and healthy deer herds and, and healthy deer habitat, habitat, what are the signs of a healthy um, deer habitat? In many cases, it's it's being able to, to look at what's on the ground and see that uh, the, the plant species there are able to, to grow um, you know, the way that they would without being completely browsed to the ground. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for, to a layman, um, you know, you, if you take a look, say if you're in a wooded situation, um, you know, there should be plants growing from the ground, you know, all the way up through into the canopy. There should be, you know, lots of seedlings there to replace the generation of forest. Uh, if you are in, uh, you know, an old field situation, there should be lots of variety of, you know, flowering plants and herbaceous plants. So uh, when those things are removed, you know, when we see forested uh Areas that have nothing on the understory, you know, on a browse line. Uh, those are the examples of a uh, hey, there's just way too many deer here. You know, then there there is enough food. So it's uh in some cases it's difficult to see that because a lot of people uh, you know have never seen a forest that mm-hmm. truly should look the way that, that it's supposed to, or it would uh, if the deer herd were in balance with what that habitat could support. You know, it's funny you said that because we actually had someone on our. Um uh, podcast Facebook page today kind of make that comment, you know, and I forget with my age sometimes and what I've lived through and what I've seen that that there are people today that don't know what a healthy forest look like or mm-hmm. edge habitat look like. They've never seen a healthy edge habitat. They've only seen it where it's devoid of, of a shrub layer or it's filled with invasives. Mm-hmm. Now, I vividly remember the first time that I walked into the woods in New Hampshire and um, when I left Pennsylvania, you know, Pennsylvania historically high deer herds, you know, lots of uh, problems in the, in the forested environments. When I went to New Hampshire at this time, uh, New Hampshire was one of the only states in the country that were actively trying to grow a deer herd. Um, much lower deer densities than just about everywhere else. And uh, I vividly remember walking into the woods there and thinking, my gosh, this is, looks like a jungle. <laughs> it looked nothing like any woods that I had ever been in in my life. And then it wasn't until I had been there a little while that I I realized what was going on. This is how a healthy hardwood forest and healthy uh, pine forest is supposed to look. So this is it. If you remove deer or at least manage deer better, this is what you get. And I just remember being so thick and birds everywhere and all this other wildlife, you know, just teeming with this wildlife. And I realized, wow, if you do a good job and manage this environment appropriately, this is what you get. And uh, so that was a huge eye opener for me. And uh, it was exactly what I needed as an aspiring deer biologist. It, it, the, all those species can coexist together if it's managed properly. Mm-hmm. You can get the birds and the deer and everything like that. Tom, you you were making a comment the other day about throwing a tennis ball. Who did you yeah, hear that, and quote that was, from? We, we started doing a lot of research. Um, and I think that was actually an article that Lindsay Thomas Jr. had written from okay. QDMA um, about taking a tennis ball or a football into the woods and uh, just throw it in any direction, and if you could see where it landed, you probably didn't have good deer habitat. You wanted to lose the ball. If you could lost the ball, then you had had good deer habitat. And but, it's a really good analogy that I think anyone could kind of envision. Um, just you don't even have to bring the ball with you. Just hey, if I threw something in that direction, would I be able to find it? If the answer is yes, then we need more uh, or fewer, probably fewer deer and more plants. Well, it's funny because you you say that, and on the last hike we did. You know, we could see there was no shrub layer at all. Mm-hmm. I could have thrown it 50 yards. Minty and might have a little bit of aroma or taste that they don't necessarily like. But but the education purpose, like I felt it was interesting that you're pointing out things that perhaps if they're getting browsed, the habitat is lacking the right biodiversity for deer health. It's what What led you to that path of education rather than just saying plant these things, these things are good instead of, you know, showing the way you do, which I think is phenomenal. As much as anything is by teaching people how to to use the land and what is already being provided, um, we can have a much bigger impact on the resource because rather than somebody spending you know an average of two hundred and fifty dollars per acre to plant something, by the time you look at lime fertilizer seed, and you go through all of that time and resources. You just can't plant many acres. However, you could take that same amount of money and impact, you know, tens as many acres in an early successional vegetation standpoint by understanding just how to provide or get sunlight to the ground and let that soil bank, 
you know, expose what is there. And and I'll say this, I'm not anti, because I used a lot more su- early successional vegetation in the past. So I'm not anti food plot at all. I just think that we can be much better managers if we do a better job making sure that we enhance the acreage of these forbs and broadleaf plants for deer. And I agree they will come back. Uh, one of our uh, favorite people, Dr. Emil DeVito here in New Jersey at New Jersey Conservation Foundation, had done a study. He was talking about how he'd gone through the woods, and as a younger person, it was filled with maple leaf viburnum, and now there was no understory. So they just took an area, and they fenced it off, and they were curious what would happen if they could just keep deer away from that area for a second, and it all came back. The The, the root biomass was there, the seed bank was there, and everything came back and flourished. So – you know, it just kind of points that if it's managed properly, you can still have all those things without planting, without having to go through and plant it all. If, if you could just manage it properly, it, it will all come back. That's right. And if you take a look, and studies have shown this in a, in a wooded environment, a forest that has an overstory as far as actual food on the understory. You know, just what's available to deer that they can reach, not counting apples and acorns and that, but just browse that's available. In a closed canopy forest, there's only... 50 to 100 pounds of food available per acre wow. now e- each deer is going to eat about 2,000 pounds of food a year smaller dearly less bigger dearly more but on average about a ton of piece so you need a lot of acres of closed canopy force to feed a single deer so but in a food plot in you know we can have a lot more food than that obviously um, if we do a good job managing those woods and have openings and understory we can kick that up to a thousand to fifteen hundred pounds per acre so good management in woods provides a lot more food now compare that also in an early successional vegetation standpoint with good management with no cost for seed or lime or fertilizer or any of that just good management, we can easily get to 3,000 pounds or more per oh, acre wow. of high-quality deer food. So suddenly, you know, as far as actually providing tonnage of food, that is the best way to be able to do it on a large scale. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and if you do that, then suddenly you get better regeneration in your forest because they're not trying to eat every single stem. You know, you don't get as many flowers eaten in the neighborhoods. Uh, because suddenly you have a much fuller grocery store that's available to those deer in that neighborhood. And and you have a much better ecosystem too. It doesn't just benefit the deer, it's benefiting the birds and, and all the other animals that depend on that. So you're Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly right. Now now one of the things that QDMA advocates for uh, actively is removing invasive plants. So we talked about native plants and what can be used and how to attract them. So what what led to the position of actively uh, advocating for removing and, invasive and plants. i'm even going to add on to that and um i know you advocate for some other forest management techniques in addition to removing native plants like hinge cutting and and um kind of creating openings in in the forest so you'd have to let a little bit of sunlight through can you touch on those as well sure um we we just fully recognize the the problems that invasive species cause you know uh We'll talk about, you know, autumn olive or bush honeysuckle or yeah. multiflora rose, stuff that just takes over, you know, acres and acres of not just open fields, but, you know, I can show you woods uh, all over the Northeast that are fully uh, are filled with honeysuckle and autumn olive in the understory, you know, under oak stands. So it's, it's not just a field thing, but these invasive plants, you know, take over all of these acres and really uh, reduce the quality of that for a lot of wildlife. So the thing is, we say, hey, you know what? Sure, they provide some cover, but in most cases, they're not providing food. Hey, but hey, we could remove that invasive, replace it with a native plant that provides food and cover, doesn't give you all of the problems of you know taking over like these invasives do. So it's just much healthier all the way around for all the plants and all the wildlife. Wow. So we are, we are big advocates for that. And I think in a lot of cases, it's not that people um, – won't remove it in many cases they just don't understand how bad that plan is there or how much better it would be for wildlife if that was replaced with a native so so we spend a bunch of time uh, just trying to provide that information to help them make good choices and and let them know how they can they can replace it with something that's far better for uh, the wildlife that you know that they that they care about are there are there states or or even organizations that you f- that you feel are knocking it out of the park that are just doing such an incredible job with with creating habitat and fixing some of these things that they're just having like such a healthy deer herd that it's it's or 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 
or states that have turned it around that that went from having maybe a massive uh, overpopulation problem to actually uh, getting it right? Uh, yep, there are. And actually, um, my home state and your neighbor, uh, Pennsylvania, has done a tremendous job over the past two decades. Uh, at one point, Pennsylvania was widely recognized as, as having one of the poorest deer management programs in the country. Way too many deer for what the habitats could support and uh, you know a very young buck age structure. Today, it is far different. Pennsylvania today does a much better job balancing deer herds with what the habitat can support. Tremendous age structure on both the buck and doe side. And from the habitat side, well, we're very fortunate in Pennsylvania that we have about four and a half million acres of uh, public lands. Uh, now, a lot of that is state forests or state parks, but we have a lot that are game lands that are managed by the Pennsylvania Game Commission, specifically for hunting and trapping. And uh, the, the habitat crews do a tremendous job across much of our state, um, and especially from a prescribed fire perspective. Within uh, the last few years, they have reinstituted a prescribed burn program and annually oh, wow. burn uh, over 10,000 acres on our game lands, which is extremely good for wildlife habitat. Mm. So, wow. so Pennsylvania has is really knocking it out of the park in, in a lot of cases with that. And uh, so they have completely turned around you know, what uh, what we had historically here. So, yeah, they do a very, very good job of that. And I know that's going to vary per area too. Like I, you know, I mentioned on the last podcast, I grew up in Levittown, PA, which is very populated. I never saw a deer in my life, <laughs> I think, until – I, I, I want to say I was in my early 20s and I was landscaping and we were working in northeast Philly, and which is even more populated. And the backyard butted up to where the police stables were. And we turned around and literally there were 200 deer that came out of nowhere. <laughs> and there wasn't an area for 200 deer to be, but they came out, they browsed, they were gone. Like we don't know where they came from or where they went because <laughs> we were in the city. We were We were literally in the city. So it's – you know, you can imagine the, the population there and, and that – you know that was back in the early '90s. I'm sure mm -hmm. that area with that kind of density and and get losing more and more habitat has gotten harder and harder. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you have definitely open areas too in PA. Where, mm -hmm. yeah. now, now, Kip, one of the things you touched on a couple times was balanced deer herds. What what is a balanced deer herd? And and um, I I know where you're going with it, but uh, how does removing does from the population go in or help balance that herd? Well, I think as, as managers, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we don't have more deer on the landscape than the landscape can support. And uh, so uh, we reference, you know, balancing that deer herd with the amount of food and cover that's there so that all the deer get enough to eat so they're healthy and so that they're not negatively impacting that habitat by, you know, removing all of the understory or all of the plants. So uh, that's a, it's a fine line to get to and you know, each state's wildlife management uh, agency you know, selects the number of deer they would like to see shot each year so that they can try to keep it at that balance point so there's not too few deer or too many where they are negatively impacting that habitat. So that, that's really what that balance point uh, references. And, of course, it changes based on the, the quality of the habitat. In areas where you're doing a lot of active land management, you know, you're, you're managing those early successional fields, you're, you're managing the forest. Those places can simply carry a lot more deer and other wildlife uh, than places, you know, that have very little management. So um, it's, it can be a difficult concept for, for a lot of folks to, to realize because everybody wants more deer. You know, there's not a single, <laughs> I just, every hunter wants more deer. You know, not, not every bird watcher or, uh, you know, suburbanite wants more, but, um, you know, Hunters want to see more, so it's often a difficult challenge for agencies to to explain to them why they, they shouldn't necessarily always have more. And uh, I'm a hunter. I'm a lifelong hunter. I get it. You know, I'm a wildlife biologist, so I understand the science. But on the other side, I'm a hunter, so, you know, I never want to see less deer when I go hunting. But yeah. uh, I at least understand the need to, to not have more mm -hmm. than what the habitat can support. Yeah, we, we, we learned on the last episode that there's places in New Jersey that are – they they were saying pre reintroduction like they felt a healthy habitat was ten deer per square mile and there's places that range between a hundred to three hundred deer per square mile, <laughs> yeah. so, which which isn't healthy you know obviously but you but know at the same time there's people I know in this town and and other people I've met across the country who say oh I see way less deer now than I was when I was a kid but statistically that just can't be true 
And um, even in my own hunting experience, I found that once I started listening to some of these podcasts and learned, oh, you got to conceal yourself a little bit better, play the wind, um, maybe even move around a little bit, I started seeing way more deer than when I went to the same tree stand every time and went straight from work and smelled and (laughs) probably wasn't doing it how I wasn't doing it in a way that was going to lead me to success i still had some success but not nearly as much as as when uh when i changed things up so um one thing that we have to touch on before uh i know we have a hard stop here but uh, we want to touch on before we we start to wrap up is um your field to fork program and the catching into that whole locavore movement and and um people who want to source stuff from their local environment go to farmers markets go to their local farm stands and and buy things from around here well there's people who want protein too um how have you capitalized with that field to fork program on that local war movement well that is one of the biggest things right now and all wildlife management is is trying to recruit additional hunters um and that local war movement is really where it's at um mostly because the vast majority of of the u.s public uh, supports hunting uh, about 80% of adult Americans support legal, ethical, regulated hunting. However, only about 4% of the U.S. public hunts. So there's a huge percentage of our population that supports it, but don't in many cases simply because they've never been asked to go or they just didn't grow up in a hunting family. And uh, as I said earlier, it was the most natural thing in the world where I grew up was to hunt. That's not the case today. You know, it's most people today are not exposed to it. We are a more urbanized society than ever before, so people just aren't growing up with the same opportunities. So what we see is there is a lot of people out there, you know, in that 20-plus or 30-plus age range that would love the opportunity to to collect or procure their own meat. Um, They just don't know how. So our Field to Fork movement is all about taking or finding those people who would like that, matching them with a mentor who can teach them how to do that, and then be able to take them actually hunting so that they can collect their, their own deer. And what we have, you know, in many cases, there are so many deer. And you guys, your state's a perfect example. Yeah. New Jersey is the most urbanized state in the country. Yeah. You have high deer herds. You have lots of deer, lots of opportunities. It's the perfect place for people to, you know, don't have to go far at all to be able to hunt to procure those, you know, high-quality protein for their families. And, and that's just a hot thing, and that's – we're trying to capitalize on it and be able to teach more people and get more people into it. And uh, it's, it's the perfect time for something like that. Now, is that program available in, in all the states? Like, is that, or is it only certain areas that, that, that's, that's. Working? Well, it's a, we, we have greatly expanded it. We have okay. started with a model uh, a few years ago where we wanted to see, Hey, can we build a program that will work? So we started going to farmers markets and, then people, hey, you know, would you like to try venison? And that's almost how this conversation always started. It wasn't, okay. hey, do you want to go hunting? It was, would you like to try some venison? People said, sure. And then that would lead to a conversation of, wow, where can I get this? Well, in, in the United States, it's illegal to buy it. However, you know, we could teach you to be able to get it yourself. So that's often how we find the hunters. We developed this program in Georgia, got to the point where we knew we had a good program and we knew exactly how to run it and teach it. So we expanded it to uh, many more states last year. Okay. Uh, and the, the thing is right now is we are looking at taking the next step to really scale this up to where we can get it to people's hands all across the country. And really we, we don't have enough employees you know, to be able to go around and teach these classes everywhere. But we absolutely can get these teaching or these trainings on, you know, a video or on the web where anybody can look at it, follow the program to then be able to, okay, this is how I mentor somebody else. This is what I should do. Or from the mentor or mentees and, hey, this is, I can watch this and learn, you know, what I need to know to, to be able to go do this. So, so that's really where we are right now, looking to scale it up to make it available to everybody because we know we have a really good model. Um, we just need to be able to replicate it. You, and a great example for me, I think that's an incredible program. Where I grew up, like I said, I didn't know anyone that was a hunter. But where I live now, it's not the case anymore. But the the local high school used to give off the first day of hunting season. That was a that was one of their holidays, and mm-hmm. and it wasn't unheard of to have people with with gun racks in the back of their their truck. <laughs> you know, at, at that point. So I have a son that 
you know, the other thing I want to say for me is it's really easy to say you don't like venison if you've never had it cooked mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, once I moved here and, and there's a fair amount of hunters that I work with and you have it done well, it's a big eye opener. So I have a son that wants to learn to hunt, but I'm not a hunter. And I don't know that I necessarily have an interest, but a program like that would be perfect for him to be able to introduce him to to that mm -hmm. oh, it, it absolutely would so yes that that's exactly what would would help him and um you know and i can help uh, help you get him uh, hooked up with something like it or lined up uh you know afterward uh, if you're interested oh that would be i would i would love that thank you thank you i, I really appreciate that <laughs> yeah and even I'd, I'd heard of the program before but uh I didn't know that much about it. And you guys had a great video on your website that I'm going to share in our, our Facebook group about how like you went to the farmer's market, you had a couple classes you had, then you actually took people out on a weekend. Obviously that's not going to be able to happen everywhere, but, and then they actually shared in their success. You'd hope that someone would harvest the deer and then they'd share the butchering experience and the tracking experience and, and, um, and then eventually eat it all together. And just, it, Hunting is a community where you can really go almost anywhere in the country. Myself, well, even myself, I can go almost anywhere in the country and have a conversation with someone about hunting. You just got to pick up on the cues when you're looking at someone <laughs> that they hunt or not. But um, but it's kind of a a bond that people share wherever you go, and um, it's nice to have bring new people with new ideas in that thing. Well, you like mentoring people too. Oh yeah, you would, yeah. yeah. That's what I, I was going to ask you off air if you had one of these programs in new jersey and if not that i'd definitely want to help uh kick one off if uh if that's possible uh i think it is and uh i, I think that that would be great yeah. so uh and that's you know the, the fact that it's centered around me um makes it most uh, enjoyable to people uh, most interesting to people so um yeah and particularly now given you know all the meat shortages with covid19 mm -hmm. uh you know, I'm I'm very very appreciative that uh, you know we went into to the spring with a, a freezer full of venison. Uh, both of my kids hunt, and then I hunt. So uh, we uh, it, it certainly makes a difference, and I think we're going to see a lot more people in the woods this fall for those same reasons, trying to, to put a little more meat in the freezer. Yeah, I, I really think that COVID nineteen has been a game changer for a lot of people yeah. with that, and their their thinking's a little bit differently. So I I yeah, think I, that's that was one of the first things you saw when when COVID-19 hit is everyone started going to buying vegetable plants and said, oh, I'm going to have a big garden this year. Cause I don't know what's going to be at the grocery store in, in May, June, July. And, and we've talked yeah. about supply chain disruptions, yeah. you know, even as a business that, you know, th there may be a point where there's not enough business sustainable to keep some of these companies going. So it may get mm -hmm. harder and harder to, to find some of this stuff uh, in stores. So if you mm -hmm. can, whatever you can take care of on your own, is that so, more power to you? Yeah. So th there's a couple things we like to wrap up with. And first is we've just talked to you for almost an hour now. How can the public get involved with your program and, and help you guys out? Well, we're, we're a member-based organization, so uh, we would love to have them join. And they can join right at QDMA.com. Um, at the very least, I encourage folks, you know, if you're interested in deer or wildlife and enhancing habitat, um, Go to our website, and you can at least look at all of the resources that we have there, information. We, we want people to have a better understanding of, you know, of deer biology and, and how they impact other wildlife. And whether you like deer or songbirds or squirrels or something else, uh, deer are impacting you know, mm -hmm. those other populations. So um, we teach people about animals, how, you know, how to enhance habitat, you know, like what we can do to be good stewards. So uh, I love encourage them go and you can look at that all those resources we'd love to have them join because uh the more members we have you know they have access to, to additional things our magazine being one of those things but uh, then it just allows us to have more mission and you know and do more uh for our, our nation's wildlife resources so uh I hope folks will, will at least check us out and uh, consider joining I hope so too we're going to share all those links so we'll make mm -hmm. sure on the website uh people if they want to find it will be easy to find um and then our last question, we always end every podcast with this question, uh, since we are Native Plants Healthy Planet. Do you have a favorite native plant? And if so, what is it? Man, I'll tell you what, one of, I, uh, there are a lot of native plants I really like, but uh, blackberry is high on that list. Ah. And, uh, and I will tell you, speaking strictly from a deer perspective, uh, blackberry grows almost everywhere that whitetails live. 
So it's wide, uh, widely dispersed across their range. You know, does great in those full sun environments. So uh, lots of forage for deer, and of course the berries are unbelievable for us. So uh, lots of birds, bears, deer. Uh, take advantage of those. So uh, I'm a big blackberry fan. It, man, if 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 someone has never picked fresh blackberries from the wild, it ruins you. I, I every time <laughs> I buy blackberries from a supermarket, they're never as good as what I've gotten from the wild. Like I keep hoping that they'll taste as good, and they never ever taste as good. And I almost I'm disappointed every time. So it's it's ruined me. I I like that choice. Thank you, Kip. <laughs> So we always do a final thought as well. One of the things we always end up with after that last question is um, we give you the floor and and you can sum things up or if there's something you want to promote or if, or if you just want to – one last thing, you can say whatever you want. You have the floor. Uh, you're, you're more than welcome to it. All right. Well, well I'll say this. You know, I appreciate uh, what you guys do in, uh, in educating folks about uh, native plants. You know, and, and how good we can do for the environment. And then for a wildlife species, you know, if we enhance native plants, there's certainly a lot of uh, invasive, not even invasive, but just non-native stuff that certainly has value to wildlife. And I, I'm not one to say that they're all bad. However, uh, I challenge anybody who, you know, who finds a non-native one they really like, um, that they can't find a native one that's better. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, uh, so you know, there's, there's no reason for that. So um, appreciate what you guys do. We certainly love to see the native species out there. We want to see people involved with, with managing the land and, you know, and enhancing that, not just for deer, but for all wildlife species. So uh, the more that people are engaged, whether it's literally at a bird feeder or hiking or anything, you know, if they're engaged with the natural resources, which means that they're a little more attached to them, they understand them a little more, and, you know, that makes them better stewards, and that's what's important to us. I think that's a great point. If you, if, if you could just get someone to spend a little bit more time uh, and become one with it, what a difference it makes and how they view it, um, you know, and, and we really just want good ecosystems. We, we'd like to see it improve and not uh, get worse, and that's – the more we can educate, hopefully, the better it gets. And it's 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 fixable. Everything is fixable. We're not we're not past repair. <laughs> we're you know we we really feel that that this is still this is still a uh, doable project. Tom, do you have a final thought? Friend, I'm going to let you go first. That was pretty much my final thought. <laughs> oh, okay. That that was it. That was it. I, I guess you know that was I just that we're not we're not beyond repair. Mm-hmm. That yeah. everything that we're doing. For education purposes, um, be involved, get involved. All these great organizations, you don't have to agree or be a part of all of them. Be a part of one of them and make a difference. And, you know, plant some native plants. What a difference and help that you're making for local ecosystem and habitat. You can start small and work your way up, but everyone can get involved with the smallest steps. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So for me, it's a. I think our listeners probably gotten the point by now that through our business, we work with a variety of different groups. And even though they might have different reasoning for why they're doing things, they're usually following the same path. And uh, one of the things that really hurts me is seeing, hey, you have a lot of folks that are passionate about native plants or passionate about birds and, or passionate about deer, and they tend to not get along, even though what they're doing, the steps they're taking to accomplish their goal are almost identical. Yeah. And uh, we get a lot further if we work together. And um, but there's one thing that I think they all can agree on, and that's that we need to to conserve more land and, and protect our public lands. And that's why it's really important that everyone goes and uh, calls their their state representatives because we have the Great American Outdoors Act is uh, scheduled for a House vote. Uh, I think early next week. I want to say it's the 22nd. Um, and it's almost got unilateral bipartisan support. It's I, I forget how many bill sponsor it has, but Make sure you call your representative and make sure they're supporting that as well, because that's going to do a lot to dedicating funding towards a lot of these public lands that people use to go bird watch and just about. I think it's every county in the country has some funding that they've used for this program. Kip, you probably even know more than me, but uh, no, I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, QDMA has backed that very strongly, and actually, I submitted three more letters to uh, the representatives this morning, um, encouraging them to to continue the push on that. So. 
yeah, thanks for uh, for encouraging folks to do that. That is a great piece of legislation for us. So anybody who likes wildlife uh, should support that. Yeah. All right. So with that, awesome. we're we're all wrapped up. So thank you guys for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening about deer management with Kip Adams from the Quality Deer Management Association. Soon to be have a new name and uh, new name. Yeah, you'll keep you'll know about that when when uh, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find even more about their organization by visiting www.qodma.com. I really advise you do that. They have a ton of great and, and educational information up there. Um, make sure you like their, their Facebook page, Quality Deer Management Association on Facebook, uh, at Q, the QDMA on Instagram. And if you thought Kip was really cool, you want to go follow him, um, you can follow his Facebook page at Kip Adams on Facebook or at Kip Adams underscore QDMA on Instagram. So thank you guys for listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pinelands Nursery. Ooh, you did good. As promised, as <laughs> promised, we're we're switching back. So I'd like to give a great big thanks to Stephen Marr for contributing our theme music. You can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, YouTube at Pinelands Nursery, and let's not forget the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. We're going to keep this conversation going after this one. Yeah, and you can listen to the Native Plants Healthy Planet <laughs> podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also check us out on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review while you're there. Um, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, uh, YouTube, or you can just ask, ask Alexa to play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. Thanks, everyone. I'm Tom. And I am Fran Kip. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Absolutely. My pleasure, guys. Uh, thank you. And, and thanks again to everyone. We'll see you again next time. Until then, keep it native. In meadows, woods, wetlands, and dales grows a bounty of beauty that never fails. Our native plants so diverse and so rare treasures of our land beyond compare. For the friends below, soaring oaks above. These plant has a place, each bed is love. Modern caterpillars must know a wheat so tall. These buzz about, sipping nectar call. Oh, native plants, how do you grace this land? In your diversity, we will take a stand. To protect, to preserve, our generations of calm, and beauty. Second to none to protect and preserve the earth to restore the native plant food that you just can't ignore. Golden god asters, and flowers galore. Menards so stunning can't help but adore. Their colors, their fragrance, a place for the eye. Their value to wild like no need to disguise. Native plants, how you grace this land. In your diversity, we will take a stand. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.